Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent. Uh, the theme for this Sunday is very simple. It is faith. Uh, faith in the Lord's word and promise which saves. Um, the Old Testament lesson, the Old lesson, the Gospel lesson all have that same theme. The sermon is based on the Old Testament lesson this morning, uh, the Bronze Serpent. To begin this morning, we will we will sing hymn number 508.
first lesson this morning is the Old Testament lesson. We read from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. They set out from Mount Hor along the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. But the people became very impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Look, there is no food, there is no water. We are disgusted by this worthless food. The Lord sent venomous snakes among the people, and the snakes bit the people. As a result, many people from Israel died. The people went to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed on behalf of the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a venomous snake and put it on a pole. If anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. Moses made a bronze snake and put it on the pole. If a snake had bitten anyone, if that person looked at the bronze snake, he lived. The word of the Lord. The psalm for this fourth Sunday in Lent is Psalm number 38. We will sing any of this song. Thank mm -hmm. The second lesson this morning is the epistle lesson. We read from Ephesians chapter 2. But God, because he is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. He also raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He did this so that in the coming ages, he might demonstrate the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for this fourth Sunday in Lent is recorded in John's gospel. We read from chapter 3. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned. But the one who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the basis for the judgment. The light has come into the world, yet people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. In fact, everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light, or else his deeds would be exposed. But the one who does what is true comes toward the light, in order that his deeds may be seen as having been done in connection with God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll continue with hymn 391. and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of our Savior, Jesus, who was lifted up on a cross to save us, dear friends. 
water moccasin, rattlesnake, cottonmouth, copperhead. Those are all names of the deadliest snakes that reside in North America. The bite of one of those snakes, from what I understand, can kill a person in a very short time unless he or she is treated quickly. To reverse the effects of a, the bite from one of these snakes, a person is to be treated with an anti-venom. An anti-venom, in very, very general terms, is venom that has been taken out of one of these snakes and then is used to treat the person who has been bitten by one of these snakes. The person who is treated with the anti-venom usually survives. The people of Israel encountered snakes in the region around the land of Edom. The snakes bit many people and many people died. In their misery, the people of Israel called out to the Lord. And the Lord provided a way for them to be saved from the poisonous bites of the snakes. It was a proposal that seemed odd. It was a proposal that took a lot of faith to believe. But those who had faith in the Lord's word and promise were saved. And that is what we would like to learn from this very fascinating Old Testament lesson. God's remedy to sin is faith. We first note that sin is deadly. But then we note that the Lord has the antidote. They set out from Mount Hor along the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became very impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Look, there is no food, there is no water, and we are disgusted by this worthless food. The Lord sent venomous snakes among the people, and the snakes bit the people. As a result, many people from Israel died. The people went to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the snakes away from us. In our travels, many of us have encountered a detour. The road we are traveling on is closed for some reason, and so we are instructed to take a detour. The detour is usually the longer way around, and it most likely will take you most time. Most likely will take you more time. A detour can be a test of patience for some of us, especially if we have been on the road for a long time and are anxious to arrive at our destination. We encounter the people of Israel, the Israelites, traveling today toward the promised land. After wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, they were ready to enter into and take possession of the promised land, but then they encountered a problem. You see, they had to travel through the land of Edom to get to the promised land, but the king of Edom denied them permission to go through his land. This meant that the Israelites would have to go around Edom instead of through Edom, this meant that the Israelites would have to take a detour that was longer in both distance and in time. You can see that detour on that insert I put in your worship folder. It was a long way around the country of Edom. These people were on the cusp of inheriting the promised land. They were anxious to get there, and now they had to take this detour. This detour turned out to be a test of patience for the Israelites. Because they were forced to take this detour, and because their arrival in the promised land would be delayed even longer, we are told the people became impatient along the way. In their impatience, they spoke against God and against Moses. They complained to God, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Look, there is no food, there is no water, and we are disgusted by this worthless food. 
even though they were 40 years removed from the Exodus when God took the people out of slavery in Egypt, their complaint was still the same as the generation before them. God had taken them up out of Egypt so that they could die in the wilderness because there was no food here and there was no water. They even had the nerve to complain about this worthless food. They were talking about manna. The manna which God had graciously given them and which had sustained them for their 40-year wandering in the wilderness. Our mouths drop open when we see and hear their bold complaints. The Israelites had fallen into a great sin. They were rejecting God and His gracious gifts in unbelief. Their sin was deadly. Unless they repented of it, they would die eternally. But the Lord did not want this to happen to His people, so He disciplined them. In order to bring them to the realization of their sin and to repentance and to rescue them from eternal death. And the Lord's discipline took the form of venomous snakes. These venomous snakes bit the people and as a result, many people from Israel died. And the Lord's discipline had its desired effect. When the people saw many of their fellow Israelites dropping dead from snake bites... They went to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the snakes away from us. The people humbly confessed to Moses that said that they had sinned against him and against God, and they begged Moses to intercede for them before the Lord by praying to have the snakes taken away. the Israelites had undergone a great transformation. They went from people who were complaining against the Lord to people who were now seeking the Lord's forgiveness and help. The, Lord, the Lord's discipline worked. The snake bites had brought the people to a realization of their sin and to repentance, and now the Lord could give them the antidote for their sin. So Moses prayed on behalf of the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a venomous snake and put it on a pole. If anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. Moses made a bronze snake and put it on the pole. If a snake had bitten anyone, if that person looked at the bronze snake, he lived. As the Israelites requested, Moses prayed to the Lord. And the Lord's answer is bewildering to us. He told Moses, make a venomous snake and put it on a pole. If anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. The Lord's answer was not to take the snakes away. Instead, Moses should make a venomous snake and put it on a pole where everyone could see it. And even more bewildering is the Lord's direction to Moses. If anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. Anyone who was bitten was directed to look at the snake on the pole, and anyone who did look at that snake on the pole would survive his snake bite and live. Imagine how that sounded to Moses and the people. Look at a snake, and you'll live. Outlandish is the word that came to my mind. It must have taken Moses a lot of faith to do what the Lord commanded him to do. And it must have taken just as much faith for the people to do what the Lord commanded them to do. And to trust the Lord's promise that all who looked at the snake on the pole would live. But that's how Moses and the people proceeded. By faith. Moses did what the Lord commanded him. He fashioned a snake on a bronze and he fastened it to a pole and those who were bitten by the snakes looked at it in faith. And the people's faith was not disappointed. Just as the Lord promised, anyone who was bitten and who looked at the snake lived. How were these Israelites saved? They were saved by faith in the Lord's word and promise. That's it. Nothing else. 
this whole incident of the snake in the wilderness is a foreshadowing of how God saves us miserable sinners. At times, like the Israelites, we complain. We, like the Israelites, complain about our food. It's not what we like. It doesn't taste good. It's leftovers. It's not this, it's not that. Yet it's the food the Lord has graciously given to us. Like Israel, we get impatient when our troubles and challenges in life increase. We complain that the Lord really doesn't care about us. Maybe we even grumble and blame the Lord for our misfortune. Our sin, all of our sins are deadly, along with our sins of grumbling and complaining against the Lord. We ought to die eternally for them. But the Lord will not allow that to happen to us. So when these kinds of things happen, he disciplines us to bring us to a realization of our sin and to repentance and to rescue us from eternal death. Although he doesn't use snakes that bite to discipline us, he does use other things that sting us and bite us to, sing, to discipline us. Perhaps it's the bite of sickness or sorrow or general unrest in our lives. Maybe it's the sting of the crosses we must bear in this life. Maybe it's the sting of personal loss or misfortune or a reversal of fortune. The Lord uses these stinging things to bring us to a realization of our sin and to repentance. And when we confess our sin, He immediately gives us the antidote for our sin. He has us look at the cross. He has us look at the crucified Jesus who was lifted up like the snake in the wilderness. And looking, he asks us to trust his word and his promise that all who look to the crucified Jesus in faith have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. How are we saved? Just like the Israelites, right? By faith in the Lord's word and promise. That's it. Nothing else. Jesus promises this in the gospel lesson. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We are saved only by the Lord's word and promises. Paul testifies to that in the epistle lesson. Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Not many of us, I think, are fond of snakes. They're creepy. They're slippery. But when you see a snake... Think about Moses and the snake he lifted up in the desert and how those who looked at it lived. And then remember, Jesus was lifted up on a cross. And all those who look at him in faith, you and me, are saved. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue with the confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page number six. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we will continue with the prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, you love the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Hear us, Lord, as we now bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive the crown of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with hymn 381.
Please rise for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. We'll conclude this morning by singing hymn 322. You may be seated. Good morning again to all of you. Just a couple of things. We will have uh, Lenten worship this Wednesday evening at 7.30. We'll continue the series Voices of the Passion this week. It will be the voice of one that condemned, and that will be Pontius Pilate. Uh, Women of Faith meets this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Okay. There's a sign-up sheet uh, if you'd like to purchase an Easter lily to decorate the church on Easter Sunday. It's back by the flower calendar. If you weren't here last Sunday, I said that we were going to do the procession with palms on Palm Sunday. I will give you a brief explanation of that. Again, we will all meet in the narthex before church. Um, you'll each get a palm branch, and what we'll do is we'll have a brief order of service in the narthex. 
and then we will uh, sing a hymn, All Glory, Lord, and Honor. And as we sing the hymn, we will come up the, the ramp here and we'll march around um, our church one time. And then you can all sit down in your seats. Um, if you'd like to stop and put your branch at the foot of the cross, that would be fine too. Uh, we will make sure all the cords and such are, are out of the way so you don't trip on them. So that's what we're going to do on Palm Sunday. I'll keep reminding, of you, reminding you of that as time goes on here. And uh, one more thing, I need to meet with all the council guys who are here this morning just for a couple minutes after the service. Thank you very much. God bless your day.